and welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel and in this video I will be doing a tier list ranking all of the novels I read in the second half of 2022. A quick reminder that whilst I try to draw an equivalency between the rating I gave for a novel and the tier in which I place said novel, it's not exactly always the same thing because I tend to prioritize the way I just feel about a novel rather than try to analyze it purely rationally, if that even makes sense. So I try to go more on gut feeling insofar as I have any. First we have Lost Gods, written by Brom, also featuring illustrations by Brom because he's also a visual artist. I believe I read this perhaps in August or September and it was a disappointment. I had been taken in by the illustrations which are absolutely beautiful and it's one of those stories that features both Abrahamic gods, pagan gods, an underworld afterlife dimension, and a premise where what people believe affects what happens to them in the afterlife. It plays around with mythology in creative ways, but I wanted more of that. A lot more of that. The plot wasn't that engaging, the characters weren't that engaging, and overall I was let down. I think I rated it a 6.5 out of 10, so for me this is going to go into C tier. However, next up is Hollow Kingdom, written by Kira Jane Buxton, and this is now a new all-time SFF favorite of mine. I adored it. I have a dedicated book review for it. This is just straight up S tier, 10 out of 10. Amazing. Then we have The Empress of Salt and Fortune, written by Nivo. This is a novella, the first in a series of related novellas. I picked this up out of sheer curiosity, I suppose, and it was all right. Nothing that special. I was interested in reading a story based in a secondary fantasy world inspired by real world Asian cultures and civilizations, Chinese specifically in this case, and I don't know, it was a bit underwhelming. It was fine, I think it was a 6 out of 10 for me, so this will also go into C tier, probably beneath Lost Gods for now. Then we come to Revelation Space, written by Alastair Reynolds. Technically the first in the series, but I'm not interested in continuing with the trilogy, I believe. And I liked it, but was disappointed by it. This was a 7 out of 10 for me. I expected a lot more depth with the theming and the world building. It had a strong popcorn factor going for it, which was entertaining, but I wanted more. So since it was still a respectable 7 out of 10. This will be going into B tier, but I expected this to be, you know, maybe A tier, something like that. And we have Weave World, written by Clive Barker. This is the very last novel and book I read in 2022. And this sadly is a novel a bit like Revelation Space, but even more so, I felt I should have enjoyed more than I actually did. I still rated it at a 7 out of 10. It had some beautiful prose, some very striking imagery, horror imagery specifically. There was something to the themes and the premise, but it was missing something for me, and it was tainted by very bittersweet feelings related to my ex, so... Mm. Bit sad about that one. Still, 7 out of 10, that means it's going into B tier, probably above Revelation Space, because I did feel more with this one than I did with Revelation Space. Then we come to something I decided to read a bit on a whim, though it was also a recommendation from a friend. Daughter of the Blood, written by Anne Bishop. This is the first book in the Black Jewels trilogy, which I will continue this year. This was the perfect palette cleanser. It's very steamy fantasy romance with edgy dark imagery. The witches, there's blood magic, there's seeing into the future using spider webs. And it just worked for some reason. Granted, it's still not above a 6.5 out of 10, but it's what I needed at the time. It kind of sits between C and B tier. For now, I'll put it at the top of C tier and I might move it at the end of the video, we'll see. Then we come to one of the nominees for the first ever Ursula K. Le Guin Prize for Fiction, The Past is Red, written by Catherine M. Valente Valenti. This is one of the better books I read for that reading challenge linked to the prize, but it was still only a 6 out of 10. I mean, it had an interesting premise, and I respect the fact that the author stuck to her premise and developed it in a 
decently convincing fashion. I did feel a few things. It does feature a bit of a candide motif with a character who is eternally optimistic and sees the best in every situation and in everyone. But yeah, I mean, beyond that, I didn't really care that much either. So this will also go into C tier, I suppose. It's kind of on the same level as Empress of Salt and Fortune. It was a bit more original for me, I suppose. So yeah, right here. Then another nominee for the Le Guin Prize for Fiction, After the Dragons, written by Cynthia Zhang, and this is also a novella. It's essentially a softcore gay romance on a backdrop of a version of reality where dragons are real animals, though only eastern Lung-type dragons remain, and they're little wee dragons and they're kept as pets, and it was very cute, but not much was made of them ultimately, so that made me sad. <laughs> and there's something to do with a fake emphysema-type disease. Ah, big whoop, it was fine, but it was nothing special. Here too is going straight into C tier, I guess. Because dragons above the Empress of Salt and Fortune, but below passes red, because it there really just wasn't much there, ultimately. Then probably the weakest thing I read for the Le Guin Prize for Fiction, The Employees by Olga Ravner. I just really did not get the point of that short story. It's a short story, essentially. I guess it was trying to go for anti-capitalist theming and stuff to do with AI, but it had a weird premise involving alien object MacGuffins, and the structure of it was strange. I didn't connect to anything in this story. I think I rated it a 4 out of 10, a generous 4 out of 10. So yeah, this is honestly a D tier entry. I cannot place this any higher. Then we have Jeff Vandermeer's latest novel for adults, Hummingbird Salamander, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Not my favorite by Vandermeer, but I mean, Vandermeer is one of my all-time favorite authors, so it's not gonna be bad. Well, okay, fine. Dead astronauts were the thing, but we're not gonna talk about that. So yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed Hummingbird Salamander. That was a solid 7.5 out of 10. So that makes it a very high B to soft A. But for now, I'll leave it in B. Again, I might shuffle it around at the end of the video. And this is the last book I read for the Le Guin Prize for Fiction reading challenge, How High We Go in the Dark, written by Sequoia Nagamatsu. In fact, it was the best one I read out of the nominees, apart from the one I think should have won the actual prize, Elder Race, written by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which is like 10 out of 10 for me. This was a 6.5 out of 10. It did actually have a very decent theming around death, grief, and how we deal those things as individuals and societies. I mean, it's a climate change adjacent plague story, or I mean, pandemic story, so it's light science fiction. The structure's a bit odd, which is why it has been compared to Cloud Atlas. It was quite moving in places, quite dark in places, but then the very last chapter kind of broke all of that for me, so it just ended up being a 6.5 out of 10 read. So I can't reasonably put it in B tier. This is another C tier read. I guess I want to acknowledge the theming, which was well done up until that very last chapter, which kind of cheapened it, quite honestly. Guess I might put it right here. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it should probably, from a more objective standpoint, be above Daughter of the Blood. But Daughter of the Blood, I actually legitimately enjoyed, even though it was a wee bit pulpy, edgy, I don't know, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna leave it like that for now. Then there's Nothing But Blackened Teeth, written by Cassandra Carr. This is a short, no, it's a novella, sorry, it's a horror novella dealing with yokai. So good old Japanese horror folklore, which I am all about. It was fine. It wasn't excellent, but it had some decent atmosphere going for it, some decent creepiness, people actually losing their fucking shit, which should be a thing in horror, so points for that. And the writing was pretty good. Yeah, I think this is also basically a C tier entry. I rated it, what, 6.5 out of 10 as well, so... Ah, uh, okay, right here. Because Yokai trumps this. Yeah, sure. And then we have Donatot's The Secret History. And this is another book where I wanted to like it so much more than I actually did. I thought something to do with ancient pagan Greek religion and mystery cults was going to be a much bigger element of the story than it actually was. It is dark academia and I did like that uh, motif and I like the academic setting. 
It was something about the group dynamic between the main characters that was engaging for me. But, uh, I don't know. Overall, something about it just didn't work. Some of the character work didn't feel as convincing as I think it should have been. It just dragged a bit after a while for my taste. So unfortunately for me, it was also a 6.5 out of 10, which means it's gonna have to go into C tier as well. But this, uh, ooh. again, honestly, it probably sits at the same level as this. I think there's more raw literary artistic merit to this compared to this, but again, this just worked for me. It was a perfect palette cleanser, whereas I was like, ah, I'm disappointed, and I do value raw feelings in tier lists a bit more than I otherwise do when evaluating books, so. Another nominee for the Le Guin Prize for Fiction, Summer in the City of Roses, written by Michelle Reese Keel, is okay. Was this a six out of 10? Or a 5.5 .5 out of 10? It was magical realism and a coming of age story. It featured an autistic character, so cool. But then something happens with that that was a bit eh? And the magical realism element just kind of comes out of nowhere and made absolutely no fucking sense. And I was just like, no, you know what? I don't care. I mean, I did like the Bohemian characters, kind of, the alternative culture or subculture aspect. Aspect. But yeah, no, it was just not that good. But I don't think it's worthy of DT. It's a low C. So pfft. I don't know. Yeah, I mean that magical realism element was just so what the fuck. So bottom C. Then we come to a Confederacy of Dunces written by John Kennedy Tool. I listened to this on audio, and the audiobook narration was very, very good. And I, I really enjoyed this one actually. I was a solid, I think, seven point five out of ten. Seven to seven point five out of ten. It's a comedy of manners, not really something I would normally read. It did feature a heavily autistic coded character that strongly reminded me of Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. You could argue it makes fun of that character, but it kind of makes fun of people in general, people and their silliness. So I didn't find it offensive in the slightest in that regard. It's a colorful setting and colorful characters, so yeah, I had a good time with this one, so I will put it in lower B, right here. Or above Revelation Space? Mm, maybe, actually. Ooh, it's very hard to place comedy above science fiction, but I think I just might have to do it. And then we come to a new, finally all-time favorite in general fiction, this time Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, written by Gail Honeyman. A very moving story, excellent as far as I'm concerned, autistic coded representation and CPTSD sufferer representation. It's quite dark in places, but it's also heartwarming in places, and I kind of needed that. And yes, whilst the ending isn't entirely realistic. Sometimes you don't need something to be entirely realistic, you know what I mean? So this is going straight into A tier, because it was a very solid 8.5 out of 10. Okay, so the last two nominees for the Le Guin Prize for Fiction. We have A Snake Falls to Earth, written by Darcy Little Badger. This is children's fiction or younger YA fiction. Not my thing anymore, I am too old for that. That being said, it was cute. It featured animal people, so spirits from Lipan Apache mythology, folklore. I'm assuming, I'm not entirely sure about that, but given the author is Lipan Apache, I think, I and the main character is Lipan Apache, so uh, if I made a mistake there, apologies, but I believe it's supposed to represent some sort of Native American folklore. So you had animal people, and it was quite cute, but there was next to no plot, very surface level world building, next to no theming. Even for children's fiction, I thought, you know, it was quite lacking. So this is also low C, honestly. Uh, where exactly in C though? I guess it was cute. Cuter than dragons? No. Honestly, it's on the same level as Empress of Sword and Fortune. Then Appleseed, written by Matt Bell. That was just a bit all over the place. There's a fawn character that doesn't make any sense. There's an Orpheus and Eurydice motif that didn't make any sense. You have three parallel timelines, two of which are connected, one of which is not really connected to the other two. And it was like, okay, and very surface level environmental theming as a five out of 10. It's just not, not good at all. So. Yeah, yeah, it could technically be lower C tier, but I'm just gonna put it in D tier, though above the employees it was better than that. Then we have Boy Part, written by Eliza Clark. This wasn't at all planned on my regular TBR, I just kind of saw it on Goodreads and I was like, sounds kind of interesting? Sure, 
I'll read it. Why not? It features interesting psychology. That's how I'm going to put it. With a main character who likes to take uh, photographs of naked men. And sometimes she humiliates the naked men in her own pictures. So there's a bit of a light BDSM thing going on. And she might be not super stable in the head. <laughs> Very toxic character. I mean, it wasn't amazing, but it wasn't bad either. There is a kind of commentary on like female objectification through male objectification done by a woman. So, you know, there's something there. So, I mean, it was a solid 6.5 out of 10 read. It kind of sits at the same level as these. There was something there, not mind-blowing either and it was quite weird i do need to stress that but points for originality a bit down to the final three we have on chessel beach written by ian McEwen. so this is also a novella it's the second thing i've read by ian McEwen. i liked it i found it engaging but also not entirely realistic in the outcome of the story and I felt there was something missing from the character work and it is a story centered on character so that to me was a bit of an issue. Still it was a solid 7 out of 10 read so this will go into B tier. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time placing Revelation Space compared to others in B tier here because it had good ideas but I didn't connect to it that much. I'm just realizing this now so Mm, maybe this. Yeah. And there is Orsinia, written by none other than Ursa K. Le Guin. So this is the very last thing I read by Ursa K. Le Guin. I believe that rounds up all of her published fiction, at least for adults, the very, very least for adults. It is not my favorite thing by Le Guin, but I still enjoyed it. This is essentially general fiction, but set in an imaginary country. So alternative <laughs> European history geopolitics, but essentially general fiction. That strongly reminded me of 19th century European literature. It was enjoyable though. I had a hard time connecting with the main novella in this bind up, because it's a bind up. Of all the stories set in Orsinia, there is a novella or short novel and then a few short stories. I preferred some of the short stories, but this is still a very solid B tier entry, honestly. Where exactly am I going to place it though? Hmm. Well, it is Ursula K. Le Guin, so maybe here. Yeah, that sounds about right. And finally, we have The Mist, written by Stephen King, my first ever Stephen King. And I thoroughly enjoyed this, honestly. It was a very good novella. It had a respectable amount of tentacles. <laughs> It was cosmic horror, good amounts of creepiness, misty creepiness. I like the ending. I prefer the ending of the original to the ending of the movie adaptation as well. There was a smidge of like, I mean, there was a moment where the main character kind of lusted after another female character a bit out of nowhere. I mean, I know, I guess if you're about to die, you want to enjoy what's left of your life, but would you really want to have sex in those circumstances? I'm not sure about that, but apart from, <laughs> apart from that, no, I really enjoyed it. So this is a solid A, actually. Still beneath Eleanor Oliphant, because this is an 8 out of 10, this is an 8.5, but it definitely deserves to be in 8 year. Yes. Right, so <laughs> for the second half of 2022, as you can see, there is um, a fairly heavy C tier, unfortunately for me. Only one an S, only two an A, and uh, yeah. So this is okay, this is good. This is... This is more or less good as well. This feels, again, a bit strange, but <laughs> I'm gonna stand by it because it just worked so perfectly as a palate cleanser. And these kind of all sit at the same level. And yeah, I think that's about right. And this is definitely correct. So there you have it, my tier list for all the fiction I read in the second half of 2022. Hopefully the first half of 2023 will be a be more positive than, you know, such a heavy C tier. So on that note, I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your continued support, and I shall see you all reasonably soon in my yearly reading wrap-up. But until then, bye-bye.